Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back to Kiryat Yarin. Sure. Today we're looking at some of the later biblical historiographic material. Last time we looked at late monarchic Judah. We talked about the final versions of kings and the Deuteronomistic history. Uh, today we're going to look at some much later material, specifically the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. And in order to do that, we need to discuss a little bit of the archaeology, or a lot of the archaeology of the Persian and Hellenistic periods. So if you can start with giving us uh, some background on the biblical sources we'll be looking at. Right. We are turning now to late, uh, the later phase of biblical historiography. The books which definitely are post-586 BC, the question is how late after the destruction of Jerusalem. I think that uh, it should be fair to say that uh, we have very little information about uh, the question of uh, date and in a way also the question of venue of composition of these books. I will give you an example, the book of Chronicles. Uh, once uh, one comes and surveys the history of research, there are um, theories regarding the composition that uh, put uh, Chronicles between the 6th century BC all the way down to the 3rd century BC, if not even later in the 2nd century. We will speak about it uh, perhaps in our last conversation, but this idea of uh, second century composition goes back uh, uh, centuries ago. Uh, we'll get to it uh, later. The problem is even uh, more significant because we do not have enough extra biblical evidence for the periods after 586, or let's put it this way, between 586, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the second century BC, the Hasmonean period. For the Persian period, for instance, uh, the only piece of information that comes directly, I mean directly on Jerusalem and the province of Yehud, the only um, uh, extra biblical piece of information comes from the uh, material from the documents of Elephantine uh, in Upper Egypt on the Nile. There is one letter there that refers to Jerusalem and for the late Hellenist, sorry, for the early Hellenistic period, the only piece of information comes from the Zenon papyri. This changes later with the Hasmoneans, but we are stepping now, we are striding now into a period of about 400 years with very little extra biblical information, which makes things far more difficult. And this is exactly the reason why archaeology is so important, because archaeology, in fact, is the only key, is the only anchor to try to uh, put uh, these compositions um, uh, in, in, in place vis-a-vis uh, -vis the historical processes in the region. Okay, so let's turn to archaeology. Uh, in our Jerusalem video, we ended with the destruction of the city in 586. So why don't you take us through the archaeology of Jerusalem uh, immediately thereafter and into the Persian period? Exactly. Jerusalem is very essential in order to shed light on composition of biblical uh, materials uh, after 586, the late historiographic uh, parts of, uh, of the Bible. Let me uh, summarize uh, very quickly what we said before in late monarchic times. Until 586, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the city covered an area of about uh, 60 hectares, 60, which means that it was the biggest city in the entire southern Levant. Uh, with a population of perhaps 10,000 or 12,000 people um, and uh, it was uh, very well fortified. This city was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. And then we have, I'm taking now a leap forward to the Hellenistic period, to late Hellenistic times, let's say in the second half of the second century BC and later, we again have a very big city. The question is what happens in between, so we are in the same situation as I described for the text, the 400 years before between the destruction of Jerusalem and the Hasmoneans is a big riddle regarding uh, uh, Jerusalem. I think that the situation is as follows. Um, one thing we can say for sure, 
if you remember, in late monarchic times, before 586, the city stretched also over the western hill, where the Jewish quarter and the Armenian quarters of the old city are located now. There's nothing there. There's nothing there from the Persian and early Hellenistic periods. So this area, which is a big part of late monarchic Jerusalem, was not inhabited at all. So we have to uh, put the spotlight on the ridge of the city of David, south of the Temple Mount. So we are again to the discussion of the parts of Jerusalem, also in late monarchic times. We have a lot of information regarding the city of David Ridge from many excavations starting uh, modern archaeology, I should say, maybe perhaps in the 20s of the 20th century, which means a century ago. There's almost no 100 square meters in, along the city of David Ridge with no excavation. And if I need to summarize all this in a few sentences, I would say the following. <coughs> there's, a nothi there's nothing from the Persian period in the southern part of the ridge. There's nothing from the Persian period in the northern part of the ridge. In these parts, once you uh, open an area of excavation, you go down from Roman to late Hellenistic and from late Hellenistic to the Iron to BC and then to bedrock. So again, the 400 years are missing in between. The only area along the city of David Ridge where there is evidence for the Persian period is above the spring and near the spring, a little bit to the south of the Gihon Spring, a limited area in the central part of the ridge. However, there too, there is no single building. There is no single wall that can be really well dated to the Persian period. And there is no floor from the Persian period. So the evidence comes only from a little bit of pottery spread over there and from seal impressions. The typical seal impressions of the Persian period carrying the name Yehud, the name of the province. Judah became Yehud in the Persian period and Judea later. So we have only this evidence, but no evidence really for settlement. And this is a big question. So how can we decipher this uh, situation? We should say that there is some sort of evidence for activity near the spring, but no habitation, no settlement found until today. Uh, the big question. So the only, in my opinion, at least the only way to uh, resolve this uh, riddle is to argue that the settlement was on the Temple Mount. So I'm going back to what we said regarding Jerusalem of the period before the 9th century BC or before the 8th century BC. The Temple Mount is the location of the original Tel. And from there, the city um, uh, expanded in periods of prosperity. And to this place, it shrank in uh, periods of crisis. However, this, even this solution is not free of difficulties because certain investigations uh, have been uh, uh, conducted around the Temple Mount. And in all these investigations, the quantity of pottery on the slope from the Persian and early Hellenistic period is limited, which means that there is quite a lot of uh, pottery from the later phases of the Iron Age. And then again, from the late Hellenistic and Roman, but for the four, 400 years in between, the Persian or Babylonian Persian and early Hellenistic, very little. The meaning is, even there, the settlement on the supposed uh, mound on the Temple Mount was relatively limited. So we are dealing with uh, a very small and limited Jerusalem, something around the Temple Mount, probably, and of course, some activity near the spring, not much more than that. Can you say something else about the stamp impressions? Absolutely. The, st the stamp impressions of Yehud are part of a long uh, legacy, a long tradition of uh, sealing, uh, stamping uh, storage jars uh, in uh, uh, Judah, Yehud, Judea, which means this is a tradition which starts uh, in the late 8th century. You may remember that we discussed this when we spoke about late monarchic Jerusalem, Judah and Jerusalem. So it starts with the Lamelech, belonging to the king, uh, impressions of late monarchic uh, times. It continues with uh, another type, the Rosette, uh, impressions of uh, the late uh, 7th century, beginning of the 6th century. And then after the destruction of Jerusalem, 
In the Persian period, we have the Yehud uh, seal impressions. There are several types. Uh, my good friends, um, Oded Lipschitz and uh, David uh, Vanderhoeft uh, published a very thorough um, uh, study on this matter and they divide uh, these uh, seal impressions into several types. The earlier ones from the 5th century, then 4th century, 3rd century, and finally the beginning of the 2nd century BC. During this time, Jerusalem was part of a Persian province called Yehud from the late 6th through the 4th centuries. Can you tell us more about uh, this province? What were its boundaries? How did it match previous uh, regional boundaries? We can do, we need to do two things here. First of all, to try to understand the extent of the province of Yehud, the borders, the boundaries of the province of Yehud, and secondly, uh, to deal with the population, with the demographic situation in Yehud, in Jerusalem and Yehud. And this too is a tricky business, tr tricky situation. Usually when one goes to uh, history of scholarship, scholars uh, uh, decided about the extent of Yehud mainly according to one biblical um, uh, chapter, and I refer here to chapter 3 in the book of Nehemiah, describing the construction of the wall of Jerusalem ostensibly in the time of Nehemiah. In that list, in chapter 3, uh, the text refers to hubs of the districts within Yehud, districts and sub-districts. And the text mentions places, and then according to these places, one can of course identify them and understand the extent of Yehud. The problem is that uh, we don't really know when this, uh, this list was put in writing and what exactly it reflects from an, an historical point of view. Not only that, uh, at least two places referred to as hubs of districts in the list were not at all inhabited in the Persian period. So we are not on solid grounds uh, reconstructing the boundaries of Yehud according to this list. In my opinion, the only way here too is to go back to good old archaeology, which means to look at uh, the most significant piece of information for the Persian period, and I refer here to what we have just discussed, to the seal impressions. And once you put the seal impressions on a map, it is really easy to see that the concentration of Yehud, the early type of Yehud seal impressions, they are to be found between, let's say, Ramat Rachel, which is a site today within the boundaries of modern Jerusalem, but in uh, 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 Persian period, it was maybe, you know, a few kilometers to the south of the old city, what's today the old city of Jerusalem or the Temple Mount. So from there, Amat Rachel, a little bit to the south of Jerusalem, to uh, the town of Mitzpah, uh, to a little bit to the north of Jerusalem. Mitzpah also is important in the biblical testimony for what happened after the destruction of Jerusalem. In any event, we are speaking about a very limited area. Between Ramat Rachel and Mitzpah, I don't have the map here with me to tell you how many kilometers. I suppose that we are speaking about maybe 15 kilometers as the crow flies from south to north and a few kilometers from east to west. That's it. This is the concentration of the Yehud seal impressions. And this is the safest uh, uh, assumption for the, at least the main concentration of population uh, in Yehud. And indeed, uh, we obtain, we have quite a lot of information from surveys, not only from excavations. So one can check the history of settlement of a, of a given place, let's say in the highlands of Judah, south of Jerusalem, or to the north of Jerusalem. And uh, all in all, we can, uh, I think, securely say that uh, there is a major crisis, major uh, uh, reduction of uh, population after 586. Uh, the crisis is very well reflected both in the number of settlements and in their size, which means equals demography. We can quite securely say that the population of this area around Jerusalem, a little bit to the south, a little bit to the north, in the Persian period was maybe 15 or 20 percent only of the population in the later phases of the Iron Age. And Jerusalem also, of course, uh, suffered a, a major blow after 586.
we were talking about numbers here and percentages. Uh, is there any way to get at the idea of a, a deportation of a population by the Babylonians and how many people were here while some people were deported, how many people came back? And can that be tracked archaeologically? Indeed, this, the, here we can really try to figure out the numbers that are given by the biblical text and also theories, the historical theories regarding what exactly happened after 586, after the destruction of Jerusalem. So we are dealing with, on one hand, the deportations and on the other hand, the coming back from Babylonia. And I think that we have to be modest about both. First of all, the Bible is also modest when it comes to the number of people deported to, from Jerusalem, from Judah. Uh, and it makes sense. The deportation probably involved mainly the literati, the elite uh, of the kingdom of Judah. The idea was to um, uh, prevent problems in the future for the Babylonian uh, grip over uh, this region, so certain groups, but a small number of people were deported, several thousands perhaps are reported in the biblical text altogether. And uh, so this means that after 86 there were two sorts of uh, blows to the population. First of all, probably the very destruction of Jerusalem and Judah, which brought about, you know, spreading of population uh, and the destruction of many of the, of the places, or at least abandonment. And secondly, also some sort of deportation to Babylonia. And then, uh, when we are dealing with the people who came back, the return uh, in the 6th century BC, after the declaration of Cyrus, uh, we are also not speaking about a torrent of people, of ten thousands of people marching, you know, uh, crossing the desert uh, in order to reach Jerusalem. Uh, people came back, there is no question about it, I think, but the numbers again were modest, relatively speaking, and the whole uh, process was gradual. I should add that we see the situation, I mean, the low-level population in Jerusalem and the vicinity, not only in the Persian period, but also in the early Hellenistic. We'll probably refer to it in a minute. So we have a process, you know, which uh, uh, was uh, a long-term process until re the recovery in the second uh, century BC. And this, of course, inflicts on the big uh, debate of what was it, 25 years ago or so, about the myth of the empty land, whether this was a myth, some said, invented by uh, uh, modern concerns in order to support modern processes in the region. I should say that uh, the myth of the empty land is not exactly a myth. Judah suffered a major blow, a major crisis after 586 BC, such a big crisis that it took the area about four centuries to recover. The early Hellenistic period, of course, begins with the arrival of Alexander on the scene and the spread of Hellenism. Tell us about the early Hellenistic period uh, in Judea. Uh, when uh, we speak about the early Hellenistic period, uh, we refer to the Ptolemaic period, which means the third century, basically. Alexander is in the late fourth century, and then uh, after a short uh, period of time, diadox and so on, we have the Ptolemaic period. And I think that under early Hellenistic, we should also add uh, the um, early phase of the Seleucid uh, rule over uh, Judea, which means the first half of the second century, basically until the Hasmonean uprising in the middle of, uh, a little bit before the middle of the second century BC. What we can say about Jerusalem is the following. Basically, the situation that I have just described for the Persian period, this situation continues also in the early Hellenistic. There is uh, no evidence uh, from the Western Hill. Uh, the evidence from the city of David Ridge Ridge is uh, very limited, mainly limited to uh, the part above the spring and a little bit to the south of the spring. Again, represented not by uh, a proper settlement, but uh, mainly a little bit of pottery and the uh, seal impressions. That's all. For the period of time, let's say between uh, uh, Alexander in the late 4th century and 200 BC. Uh, 
Then uh, recently, in recent excavations in Jerusalem, something new uh, has come up, and I refer now to the excavations to a little bit to the south of the city wall of Jerusalem, to the south of the Dung Gate, the uh, parcel of land which uh, is known in archaeology as the Givati parking lot. Over there, my uh, student and friend Yuval Gadot is excavating, and recently they found there uh, some evidence for um, activity in, they describe it as early Hellenistic. I should say that when you read very carefully what they are saying, also supported by coins, I suppose, is that we are dealing with the first half of the second century. So it's not really the Ptolemaic period. But still something happens here before uh, the Hasmonean uh, era, be before the Hasmonean period. And I think that uh, the interesting thing to say uh, here is that we see the long durée in motion again. Uh, I wish to remind you, Matt, what we discussed when we spoke about Jerusalem in the Iron Age. The mound was at the Temple Mount, and then it started expanding slowly, first expanding to the south in the direction of the spring, and then the big boom of becoming a very big city. And in fact, we have exactly the same situation all over again, in a sense that uh, the city uh, was destroyed. Then in the Persian period, we have evidence probably mainly for, or we can suppose that the settlement was only on the Temple Mount, and the same for the third century BC. And then in the first half of the second century, we can trace the first signs of expansion in the direction of the spring, which uh, is followed by another big expansion in the, let's say, very late second century, beginning of the first century, in the time of the Hasmoneans. So uh, the two can be compared, the two phases of expansion can be compared. And what about the, the broader territory of Judea? In the, the territory of Judea, I think that we can uh, say the same, uh, we can give the same description as for the Persian period, for the time of Yehud. Uh, we are still in a situation until the late second century BC of a very modest activity, um, both from the point of view of number of settlements and demography, the size of the settlements, which means demography. I th perhaps uh, there is a slow recovery more on the northern part, a little bit to the north of Jerusalem, but still relatively modest until the Hasmoneans. So far, we've been talking about the Persian period and, and the early Hellenistic period. I, I suppose there's also a late Hellenistic period we yes, should discuss. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> so we are now turning to the Hasmonean period, to the late Hellenistic. In late Hellenistic, I think that we are, uh, we mean, uh, I suppose, uh, sec late second century BC into the first century BC. And what we see in Jerusalem is something very dramatic. Uh, we have full recovery of the big city of the late Iron Age, late monarchic times, along the same lines, which means the city is again flourishing and covering an area of about 60 hectares and again the uh, biggest city probably in the southern Levant, back to not only to the city of David Ridge, but also to the western hill, all the way in fact to the area of the Jaffa Gate uh, basically. And uh, there is also a recovery of the fortifications because the city is now fortified, which means in the Persian period, there is no indication fortifi for fortification. And this is against, uh, if you wish, the idea uh, of a Nehemiah uh, city wall. We will discuss this later. Uh, against the idea of a Nehemiah city wall um, as described perhaps in chapter three in the book of Nehemiah, uh, because in Jerusalem there is not even a single place where you can really point out to a piece of fortification for the Persian period. And now, please believe me that fortifications do not evaporate, which means that in Jerusalem, as in other places, well, especially in Jerusalem, where fortifications are stone fortifications, they can be easy, relatively easily identified. So we have the Middle Bronze fortifications, the late Iron Age, Iron 2B, Iron 2C, 8th century, 7th century, and then again, the Hasmonean fortification of Jerusalem in several places. And in the Hasmonean period, 
the fortifications are exactly along the lines of the Iron Age fortifications. In certain places, there is a difference, a little bit of elevation, not exactly the same line, but very close. In other places, uh, the uh, late Hellenistic is the renovation of the Iron Age uh, city wall. Uh, for instance, in a certain place in the old city, in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. So we have this full recovery, uh, both from the point of view of boundaries of the city and from the point of view of demography. And also, I should say, uh, more monumental uh, building activities with the, the whole package of uh, prosperity from the material culture point of view. Can you put a date on that? When are the fortifications rebuilt, for example? Ah, yes. This is really a very good question, which uh, has been debated. I can say the following. Uh, there is a certain indication in the field, and then the rest is uh, all about what we know from the historical um, uh, records. Because uh, I, we should say that for the Hasmoneans, we have already historical records. I mean, uh, the Book of Maccabees, the descriptions uh, of Josephus uh, in the antiquities of the Jews and so on. And of course, in uh, uh, the Apocrypha, the second century Jewish uh, um, uh, compositions uh, of the Hasmonean period. We will speak about them a little bit later. So first of all, recently, in recent years, a piece of fortification found in the same Givati parking lot to the south uh, of the Dan Gate uh, has been identified, or there was um, a proposal to identify it with the Accra, the Seleucid uh, fortress that was uh, built uh, in Jerusalem in the first half of the second century BC and was involved in a way in the Hasmonean uprising in, uh, in Jerusalem and uh, in Judea. Uh, if this is so, what we see in the field is that this piece of fortification uh, apparently is earlier than the construction of the city wall. So you have some sort of a datum there uh, to speak about. I think that there are two more considerations and all of them lead to the same solution, I suppose. The second consideration is about uh, uh, manpower and uh, resources. In order to engage in such a relatively mon big monumental construction of a city wall which uh, uh, covers the full area of Jerusalem and closes the full city, you know, six, uh, 60 hectares, you need some sort of resources, economic resources and manpower to engage in the construction. The Hasmoneans do not have the resources and manpower or manpower and resources before they started expanding. And the expansion of the Hasmoneans start with the, in the time of Jonathan in 152 BC and more so in the time of Simeon and then reaches, you know, a significant phase of expansion only in the time of John Hyrcanus, which means in the last third of the uh, second century BC. We have to pay attention to the time of John Hyrcanus. We will get back to, to it later. And finally, I should say that there is one piece of information in uh, historical information which may be significant. Uh, something happened, something dramatic happened in Judea, in Jerusalem, in the first year of John Hyrcanus uh, on the throne. We are speaking s around close to 130 uh, BC. Uh, I'm not going to cite exact uh, dates here. Uh, in, the, in his first year, Antiochus VII, Sidetes, suddenly appeared and quickly marched on Jerusalem, basically reaching Jerusalem and uh, taking it over and demanding tax and so on. This, I think, was a major shock for the Hasmoneans, for John Hyrcanus. Hyrcanus managed to, well, Sidetes died after a very short period of time and uh, uh, Hyrcanus managed to free himself of the uh, uh, influence uh, of the Seleucids. Uh, and I think that the construction of the walls of Jerusalem was related to this uh, surprise and traumatic uh, attack, assault on Jerusalem in the first year of uh, John Hyrcanus. So altogether, when we wrap it up, we, I think, have evidence that uh, lead us to suggest, I suppose quite securely, uh, 
that uh, the construction of the city walls and the major prosperity of Jerusalem of late Hellenistic time, the time of the Hasmoneans, the Hasmonean dynasty, uh, the Hasmonean state, uh, uh, in the starting in the late second century BC. So all of this gives us good archaeological and historical background, uh, which of course brings us full circle to these ideas of literacy and uh, desire and ability to compose biblical texts. So I think uh, next time we'll be able to move on to the, the biblical part of this discussion with the late historiographical books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So I'll see you next time. I'm ready.